Greetings, my beautiful friends. Take out a pen and paper because this week we are drawing still lifes or living hieroglyphs that stand in some peculiarly expressive way for the unfathomable mystery of pure being. We focus on Rembrandt's drawing of a shell, de Schelp, from 1650. And we are also going to be practicing chiaroscuro, chiaroscuro, or this tradition of spotlighting something against a dark background for a more dramatic effect. Imagine a performer on stage in the spotlight, or a storyteller lit by firelight, surrounded by darkness. Setting up the composition like this helps the image tell a story. And we talk a lot about how objects speak to us or trigger memories to help us feel things. Neuroscientists and philosophers like to talk about how we actually think through things, that things help us out a lot, that things support and lead our thoughts and ideas and imaginations and memories in various ways. Tiny mementos and souvenirs like shells and keychains can even help us situate ourselves in space and time. They help remind us of who we are, of where we've been, and where we're going. They inform us. And um, toys can do this. When my nephew was four, he fell and got a really bad concussion. And at the hospital, we were so scared, he couldn't remember anything. Uh, he didn't recognize any of us, but he did know about his favorite stuffed animal, Sean, calling for it by name, Sean. My sister raced home to get the toy, and as soon as he touched and smelled it and put it in his mouth, all his memories came flooding back. He returned, and the little toy helped him. So toys can help us remember, and so can food. A famous example of this in Western literature is La Petite Madeleine from Proust's novel In Search of Lost Time. Proust's Madeleine is also a really good example of the way material things evoke memories of place. And places are huge. Also, it's a good example of the way um, things speak to us through synesthesia or cross-sensory cross perception. In the story, uh, the narrator, Marcel, when he encounters a strange little shell-shaped cake, a madeleine, suddenly a whole ocean of lost memories floods his consciousness. Suddenly, he remembers eating the same cake with his aunt in her bedroom, and he remembers her old gray house and the gardens, and the streets of the small town. The little cake, the piece of cake brought it all back. What this means is that humans use objects to store memory outside of our brains. We offload memory into special objects. What Merlin Donald calls exograms, exo outside gram writing, exograms, they're essentially memory aids or messengers delivering personal and cultural information through time. Little Hermeses, Michel Serra is one of my favorite philosophers of science, goes as far as to call these message bearers angels because he says they are more complex and more sophisticated than Hermes. And thanks to these little angels or other than human people or things, depending on your worldview, thanks to them, our thoughts and memories become more durable and more easily transmissible across time. Thanks to them, we get what's called an extended brain, but it's also what Marshall McLuhan says, every extension requires an amputation. Our dependence on things to extend our memories is also a limitation. Remembering is also forgetting. We shape our tools and then our tools shape us. And talk about constricting our shape. What is a shell? 
And why did Rembrandt spend so much time drawing one? Shells are ubiquitous. They were early money. And today we sometimes pick them up when we go to the beach. Do you do that too? It's really strange, like spooky. What happens when we decide that a shell or a stone on a beach is mine and we pocket it? What is that? Like a psychic lasso, we grab it and then start imbuing it with memory and meaning. It's weird, possessive. But picking up a stone or keychain may also be a very real way we can actually touch the past. There's a great essay recently published called A Stone That Feels Right in the Hand. Tactile Memory, The Abduction of Agency in the Presence of the Past by John Harries. Uh, you might want to check that one out. Shells are also symbols for the sacred. In Japan, they are called horakai and are one of the eight holy offerings and auspicious symbols in Buddhism. People use them to make music, but the shell is also... Um, it, it represents music offerings. It's a symbol for music, like how um, a saxophone is a symbol for jazz. The sacred shell is um, usually pictured standing upright on a lotus throne, decorated in scarves and in fire, like a Buddha or a dancer. Rembrandt rendered his shell reclining like an otolisk, or a nude model. Shells call to mind the ocean, which is huge, and the female body, the womb, the birth of Venus. Why else are shells so spectacular? Maybe it's because they are a form in nature that manifests symmetrical arrangements. They make visible an ordering principle in the universe. They make visible a cosmic intelligence, an angel. Also, they are like gemstones that can grow, like crystals, like bone. Are they a kind of bone? Shells are spirals, and spirals are sacred geometry. Shells exhibit the Fibonacci sequence, that mathematical sequence found in the branching of trees, pine cones, flower seeds, galaxies. It's in the curve of a wave. It's in the expanding population of rabbits. Shells, they point to all of this and more. Below the drawing, just take a minute to jot down how shells are used in your own tribal traditions and also what shells mean to you. Uh, maybe tell us a story. And you can think about turtle shells or abalone, clams, mother of pearl. That's assignment number 19. For assignment number 20, for Thursday, find your own shell or stone, memento, or um, a small toy, a keychain, hand sanitizer bottle, crumpled up mask, toilet paper roll, whatever. Just one thing though, and set it up on a table or shelf with a dark background. And draw studies and then draw a small yet dramatic still life. And the background has to be thoughtfully crosshatched and very dark, like Rembrandt's or like Andrew Wyatt's. And keep in mind that this assignment is related to the seven value sphere that we did last week, that study in the order of light. Also, choose an object that's universal, ubiquitous, everyone's got one, but also one that cuts deep into the personal, into your life right now, quarantined. And for full credit, you need to make three drawings of your object, each one about 10 to 30 minutes. The first drawing will be a page full of small studies, like the figure drawing studies that we did last week. These are just warm ups. Draw a frame about the size of your hand, as always, but this time divide it up into six segments and then draw six versions of your object, one inside each cell. I suggest you blind contour three and gesture three. I also recommend you draw your object from slightly different angles to work out your multi-perspectival understanding of it, to wrap your mind around it, to get to know your partner. 
and this should take no longer than 10 minutes. Time yourself. Drawing number two is a close-up of your object. So fill the frame, but it should be smaller than before, about the size of your palm. Focus on cross-hatching, on slowing down and cross-hatching the entire object so that it exists in shades of gray. And we get a sense of a light source. This drawing should take about 20 minutes. And then drawing number three is a 30 minute still life, looking eye level at the object, eye to eye, surrounded by dark space like Rembrandt's. And you can add in a doorway or a window or anything you want back there. A bookshelf, a person. And um, you might need to put your object on a stack of books or draw while sitting on the floor. Whatever it takes to get down to its level. And um, also remember to draw, to look for and to render the reflected light. And finally, write about why you chose that quarantine object and free associate to create a short poem or a song. And don't forget to upload your image to GroupMe or to Blackboard. And next week, we will look at a completely different approach to life, to a still life drawing. We're gonna dive deep into Zen master Mu Chi's famous drawing of six persimmons. We're also gonna talk more about Memento Mori and Vanitas. See you then, bye. Bow, <laughs>